bit each week, each week with uh, uh, in getting ready for the class, I bring back a lot of old memories. One time we were at the Historical Society and uh, the woman in the library upstairs brought out various papers and one of them actually had a uh, the social section from Rising Up Angry where my wife and I were getting married with rifles and all kind of uh, heavy stuff in those days. Um, I also am always looking for people who are interested, really aware, and want to be involved. Uh, kind of my role in life as a recruiter to the cause. And um, throughout the time of doing this class with Ewan, um, I've, I've noticed a shift. Initially, there were some people who would say, oh, well, I took it because it was the last thing available. Or, but a lot of them take it because they want to be activists. And then we try in the class to say, okay, where do you go from uh, being an activist, going to a demonstration, taking a stand to a place where you become an organizer? You see yourself over time being involved. And, um, you know, increasingly we have people coming to the class who really want to. Uh, do things to help the world become a better place. And, uh, you know, I've had ongoing relationships with, you know, maybe four or five of the kids out of the class who are seriously involved in doing progressive and important work. Um, I also learn a lot from Ewan. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll bring the talent, so to speak, and he'll fill in a lot of history uh, that I may not have remembered or never even knew. Uh, he is quite a resource. And uh, the, you know, it's, it's just fun working with young people, particularly when they're open. Uh, and I, again, I repeat, I don't have a lot of people who are taking the class who aren't into it. I used to have a few people who were back in 2016 who were voted for Trump or at least were thinking about it then. Um, I know we can't talk about that in the class, uh, but, uh, you know, it's clear that a number of them have moved to a more progressive position, and I think that's good. We are a, a city that is rich in its own history. Um, it's a history that uh, uh, is, I think, emanates around to others around the country as an important and important for people to know. Once upon a time, the whole world was watching. When in 1968, we had uh, a lot of young people show up in this town talking about the war in Vietnam and who should be the candidate of the Democratic Party. And um, you all know what happened after that. And we do talk about that in the class. I kind of been running on. I'm close to my time up. I'll uh, relinquish it to back to you. Yeah, OK, uh, thanks. Thanks, Mike. Um... This uh, you're very complimentary, but this is <laughs> normally Mike runs on and I'm the timekeeper. Anyway, um, well, I want to pass it over to Katie. Uh, Katie has been a regular guest in our class. And I think one of the things that always surprises me is uh, about the students is how little of this history they know. I mean, we're always reading papers, Mike, right? That is like I've grown up, grown up in Chicago and I didn't know that this existed at all. You know, right. that I don't know that this happened. And, uh, and Katie comes in once a year as uh, our guest, uh, as our guest to talk about Chicago's Women's Liberation Union and uh, her her own life uh, involved in these kind of campaigns. So, Katie, maybe you tell a little bit about what you feel you bring to the class, and a little bit about. I mean, we're seeing them every week for ten weeks, and you see them one week a year. But I think those themes still resonate. Yeah, <clears throat> thanks, Ewan and Michael, uh, for actually. Uh, the gift of, of meeting your students once a year. Um, I, as a, a longtime teacher on the urban studies program of Associated Colleges of the Midwest, I was very familiar with the concept of using the city as teacher. And in fact, uh, used Michael as you did, you and you do, you and when uh, we first met to fill in the blanks on some things I didn't know about as well. I think that. Um, my contribution is often uh, the viewpoint of a native Chicagoan, of a Catholic, Southside Irish Catholic white girl, um, who despite all of those things, found myself um, not only an active member of the Women's Liberation Union, but also as a 19 year old volunteering on the uh, 
answering the phone for the messages for the Jane uh, service. And Jane was an illegal uh, abortion service run by the women of the Chicago Women's Liberation Union and a, a doctor or two friendly to the cause. Uh, it was an amazing feat actually at the time and uh, serviced some 1200 women between 67 and 72 when Roe Ro v. Wade, I mean, 73 when Roe v. Wade was uh, established. Um, <clears throat> I think that what happens with the students for us is um, they, they're very interested in that story of, of Jane because uh, you and, and Michael show them the film that was made about it. So we get a lot of questions about that. But Mary and I also talk about the reality of feminism coming up, uh, particularly in the light of what Michael just said, a lot of it was in reaction to our brothers in the movement, you know, who were raised, you know, the way we all were raised and basically uh, thought that women's place in the movement was making them coffee. <laughs> Luckily, I was a little younger than Michael. And uh, by that time, by the time uh, I was dealing with guys in the movement they had already gotten a few messages about that <laughs> but the fact no. of the matter is no. the fact of the matter is um that uh the the personal is political and that was a feminist cant at the time uh, and it was also the hardest place to do politics as as a white girl doing anti-racism work on the south side where i grew up reacting to my own catholic parish's lack of um well, their devout cowardice, basically, in the face of uh, potential integration and their lack of leadership, um, along with the city's lack of leadership to bring about uh, a, a positive change. Um, I forgot the start of this. Um, oh, that that we were we were forging a new ground. Okay, we were making it up as we went along, but we were finding out that it was our job to figure out how to change the world while we were trying to do it. When the students hear that and hear stories of people their age taking on those kinds of questions and figuring out how to actually activate around it, you can see the wheels turning and you can get from some of their questions, um, how the heck did you guys do that? Or how'd you figure out? Or, you know, and it's, it's a real, uh, it's a great moment, I think, for both your guest speakers like us and the students to have that exchange to talk about um, what's still real. In fact, you know, and we flip from the 60s to the present uh, regularly in the question and answer period, don't you think? Yeah, see you uh, responding. And that to me, uh, like Michael, I, I love being around students. I love having contact with them and, and being able to, uh, be impressed by them as well as try and influence them myself. Um, and it's a great responsibility as anyone on this, uh, in this Zoom knows, if you're a teacher, your responsibility is to not waste your students' time, first and foremost, and to hopefully be giving them something good to think about and a lot of resources to uh, amplify that, that thinking. Um, when you use the student, the teach, the city as a teacher, um, it's just so rich of a, of a resource. Um, it's, it's actually harder to limit it. <laughs> um, and I'm sure Ewan has, uh, and Michael have both looked at that every semester and what can they include if they can include anything more. Um, I just find it very, and in every educational endeavor as a teacher or a guest lecture, I find it invigorating and inspiring to hear students' reactions um, to and questions upon their first hearing of, of these Chicago organizing uh, tales. So, um, and also first person uh, tellings have a special traction, I think, in a classroom. Um, and you still have to be someone interested in the students and their reaction to what they're hearing in order to uh, go somewhere with it. But, I think I, I think I could stop there and, and let people uh, start asking questions. Yeah, um, I was going to say, one other thing, Katie, I think is a lot of people, a lot of the students then kind of ask us, well, what did you do next? You know, you talk about the, the, the time when you were 18 to 23 or whatever, and then yeah. they're like, well, what do you do next? And I think 
The other thing for these students is they've not quite yet seen life get in the way. Now, we, we, we have guests who then say, well, I got a job in a hospital I was interested in. I worked in a free health clinic, uh, but, you know, then I needed a nine to five or something, you know. So we do get guests who sort of, you know, there's this, the students are very much that they're, they're not often on a nine to five type of a day at all. You know, they're, they're, right. they're judging by their emails to me asking when their assignments are due that they send just after midnight, you know? Uh, so I do think that um, sort of just explaining that life experience, uh, explaining that, you know, you, but you always had in your mind, how can I, how can I make a difference? Even if you weren't necessarily doing it, you know, uh, all hours of the day. I think, um, and Mike, I think another thing that the students, some of the students have told us they had grandparents in these organizations, mm. um, particularly, so uh, particularly African-American students who had their relatives in the Black Panthers. Um, we also have students whose experience resonate. We had what with Omar Lopez, who is a, uh, from the Latin, he was in the Latin American Defense Organization and then in the Young Lords Organization and now is executive director of an organization called Calor, which does uh, AIDS awareness within the um, Spanish language community here in the city. But he was talking, he was talking about, you know, he was talking about being active in these Puerto Rican organizations in the 1960s, late 1960s. And one of our students is saying, oh, my grandfather came to Chicago in the late 1960s from Puerto Rico. So there's able, so even if we're sort of like, it's maybe not in the part of the presentation, but in the Q and A at the end of the class, as people are drifting in and out, or as we're walking between locations, you have these really kind of resonating conversations as well, I think. Yeah, let me just say that I think that, that traveling uh, from place to place, I mean, part of the class is that we, we need to take people off campus a number of times and we do it in different amounts on different years. But some of the most rewarding and uh, lasting relationships I've had with students came through riding the L, taking a walk and getting to know them. Mm -hmm. And I increasingly find that students kind of, uh, you could tell when they're kind of interested, like, well, how did you support yourself? Or how did you raise money? Um, you know, and to try to see, again, back to when you first feel the passion around an issue, whether it's Black Lives Matter, uh, you know, something has happened to uh, how do you turn that into a lifelong uh, commitment? How do you encourage people to see that no matter what they do in their life, that they can play a part and make a difference by taking a position or a stand? Um, yeah. Yeah, they often, and, and the final project, I would say, we haven't really talked about the curricular work. We have them read um, weekly uh, weekly assignments, weekly readings. They can be anything from um, archival materials of the time period through to, you know, more recent writing about um, past events. Uh, some of Mike's writing we use, um, as well as some academic literature. But their final assignment is they've got to, pick one of the topics that we've reviewed, one of the issues that we've <coughs> reviewed, and look at organizations that are doing the same work in Chicago now. So mm. we're kind of directing them to utilize websites um, to, to sort of do a bit more digging. So, you know, what, who are the descendants of these organizations and what are they doing now? And I think one of the things that really strikes us when we're doing that work, Mike, and, and maybe Katie, you can jump in as well with your knowledge from just doing the radio show is how much in the 1960s and early 70s, a group like Rising Up Angry or even the Black Panthers were doing multiple things. They were doing legal aid. They were taking busing to prison. They were giving breakfast, giving food aid. We you know, you know sort of a food pantry type system. They were giving away clothes. They were providing health care. They were doing multiple things like providing advice for people dealing with slum lords. Um, or people being evicted. And now I think we see a little more fragmentation of um, a lot of organizations that tend to be a little more single issue. That's something that sort of strikes me. I don't know if that's an accurate, um, an, an accurate sense, but they, the students sort of begin to think about, well, how could we do so many different things at once? 
That's interesting that you mentioned that because the, the women's union, of course, like Rising Up Angry, also had the legal clinic and had the healthcare uh -huh. version. We had we had car repair training so that women would be independent, you know, of men so that they could change their own tires and change their oil and all that sort of thing back when people did things like change oil. Um, but we also had self-defense classes. We also had um, uh, the women visiting women in prison. So you're right to point out, we were doing a lot of things at once. And you would think now that we've got this kind of tool, this interwebs business, that uh, people could still, you know, have a 17 plates spinning, but maybe, maybe not so much. I'm not sure. I think one of the biggest challenges is, is what do they do today? Um, my knowledge of current organizations is not as developed as it needs to be, I think, because, uh, you know, part of what our final pay projects are, where we have them connect up the history to something going on. So they look up what's going on in housing, what's going around uh, on what's happening currently on police brutality, that kind of thing. Uh, but the other thing that we did do was we added last year, uh, some, we, last year we brought in Maria Haddon's uh, chief of staff. And this year we have former alder woman, Helen Schiller uh, to kind of talk about uh, what it's like after activism, after you're pissed off and you've taken a stand and you want to continue the momentum and do something that'll make a difference. Uh, Schiller, this will be her first year, but I think she'll be real good because she was involved way back in Uptown after Join, but uh, with a lot of kind of local organizing was came out of the left. I met her when she was coming back from Cuba on a trip years, years ago, and then she became the older woman and she had to deal with this, the straighter world. And, uh, and you know how do you make your compromises or how do you make your decisions because you know these kids are young and uh you know the world is big around them uh and they don't really see what's going to be like in 20 years but we try to talk about that that you know we're in this forever social change is ongoing social political economic change is going to be constant it's moved by the technology and the advances as well as the challenges and uh we are actually, you know, we repeat over and over that you are the future, you know, that uh, what we're talking about is, a, uh, is, is something that you can continue to add to, develop, in, enhance, improve, and uh, make a bigger difference. Um, and, you know, some of that may resonate with them right away. Some of it may be way down deep in somewhere. But I, I do think that uh, what they learn in class is going to come back around uh, and influence their life and their decisions. I think another thing, um, and then a couple more comments and we'll open to questions. I think another thing is in high school history, they do, Martin, they do Martin Luther King and then they'll do the Democratic National Convention and they'll do these big events and they don't uh -huh. see the kind of day-to-day <clears throat> -day, um, on the ground organizing that happened that enabled Martin Luther King and things like the Democratic National Convention protests that happen. And so they kind of see these kind of points in time and they don't sort of realize that they're sort of seeing the peaks of a, what, what was a much wider on the ground city by city movement. And I think the yeah. other interesting thing that we do, Mike, is we tie it in. The, this is really where I jump in and shut you up. But, you know, we tie it into things like, you know, the, the, the policy environment of urban renewal and where that came from, from the federal government in the 1940s, leading through, you know, Mayor Daly's demolition of various neighborhoods in the 1960s. So we try to, um, the changing, 19, when we talk about uh, Hispanic organizing, um, the changing immigration laws after 1965. So I think I can, what, what I often quite often do is I sort of bring in that other kind of wider political context that we then look at how it played out locally in the city on, on the ground. Katie, do you want to, um, obviously the, the big one for, for that is, and you're coming to talk about it next week for our students, Katie, is something like Roe versus Wade and the impact that that has in the early 70s on, you know, issues around that and, and Title IX and, and, and all these issues in the early 70s, all these related 
all these all these legislative moves that changed the sort of position of women in society in the early 1970s or not changed i don't know that's a that's, well i mean it's ongoing it's ongoing look at texas mm -hmm. i mean two weeks ago we had to march in this city and uh, you know uh again all the women's march uh only this time it was on a to topic that we thought we had solved 50 years ago um and it was interesting because the sound system kind of uh blue uh and all of us who were in the audience there in, in the civic center plaza were saying hi and greeting each other and having conversations that we could not have had if we were listening to the speakers say things that we had heard over and over again for the last 50 years um but the young people young women who are around us one they always have the best signs um uh, and the most uh out there signs um like one of them, well, I, I shouldn't, I, I think I can't cuss on this thing, but I won't <laughs> say that. But there was, there's the, one of the funnier ones is when a, a young woman had this sign at the very first woman's march right after Trump was inaugurated. It said, we're all here to sink our periods, hmm. which I loved, totally loved, because one, a lot of people wouldn't know what that means, maybe, i.e. guys, and uh, so they <laughs> And uh, two, it was just fun. And the fact that women's liberation people were picked on un unbearingly back in the 60s for not having a sense of humor. And Ms. Magazine once dealt with it with one cover that said, um, did you hear that women's livers don't have any sense of humor? Did you ever hear that women's livers didn't have any sense of humor? And the answer was, no, hum a few bars. Maybe I'll remember get that? No, I don't think you got that. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, so it, the, the fact of the matter is, I, I'm not sure if this answers what you started, but yes, everything that we talk about in your class in the, about the 60s and 70s has an immediate connection to today that we often are winding up show, you know, illuminating to one another in each class. I mean, in our class we are. When uh, the other woman that speaks with me was a fellow member of the Chicago Women's Liberation Union and a very uh, well-respected healthcare activist, Mary Driscoll, who's in charge of a lot of stuff at Cook County Hospital and has been for a while. Um, the reason that we do this is that we are committed to making change and making positive change and growing uh, activists in every generation following ours because, you know, we won't be here in 20 years. And we want some of the love of the people and love of the community and commitment to equity to uh, trickle on down uh, to the next generation. So uh, nothing I think could be more important than teaching and using experiential education as the pedagogy because uh, students are, different students are affected differently for in different kind, ways of learning, but, um, firsthand experience told to them by the actors themselves is pretty compelling for a lot of students, I think. Matt, we'll put it over to you for questions. Yeah, so thank you so much, you and Michael and Katie. Um, really interesting um, conversation. So if there are any questions, um, feel free, or as you have questions, feel free to put them in the chat so we can continue this conversation. Um, excuse me for a minute. <clears throat> Um, yeah, and, and we'll continue, continue to pick your brain. Um, one question I have is for your students for their final assignment, how do you connect them or how do they find the current kind of these, uh, you know, children act organizations or the legacy, you know, as they're tracing that out, how do they connect with current activists and current activity? We, well, that's what we curate a list. We have a list, okay. we give them a list. Um, I think one of the, these are freshman students they're not necessarily got developed research skills yet so i think one of the things that that we've done is we've we've curated a list and and sort of showed shown them um show sort of walk them through okay if you're talking about evictions here's a metropolitan tenants organization and things like that so we've we've tried to point and that also that has a dual purpose one it kind of shows them the current organizations working on those things if they don't know where to look and and two it enables us as well 
there's other things we're teaching. We're teaching them how to write a paper. We're teaching them how to, you know, do academic research. We're teaching them how to be good scholars. And so if we've curated a, a list of where we know they're looking, we also know kind of what we think a good paper is going to be at the end of it. So I think there's that kind of pedagogical element to it as well. You no, know, it does. And these kids improve a lot because some of the papers, the first papers they write are terrible. <laughs> I mean, they just, you know, and some of them, you know, don't have real good writing skills or, you know, I don't know where they all went to school, but uh, we require, and it's five points of their grade that they attend the Paul's Writing Center. And uh, it's amazing what happens to their writing, to be honest with you. I mean, you know, they'll, you'll, they'll turn a couple papers. We keep complaining that they haven't signed up for the Writing Center. You got one more week to be able to do it. And then when they eventually do it, the papers just uh, they shoot up in terms of the sum, you know, the summary content, the, the reflection the, that they list all of the, the, you know, resources. They make the connections between what they've heard before. Uh, you know, practice makes perfect, maybe. And uh, this mm -hmm. is a good direction for them. So I, uh, I find myself, you know, learning grammar myself when I'm working on these papers and, mm -hmm. oh, that's how you spell that, you know, so it's very, the class is very helpful to me in many ways. Um, I see the questions um, are asking about, you know, recommendations on where to get the materials and someone, uh, let's see, it was some Mr. or Ms. Martin who said Chicago History Museum is interested in donations. And I was going to say the Chicago History Museum has some good collections uh, on this material. Um, they have, I think, the entire Studs Terkel um, collection, or, or at least they used to. I think the other source for information on this and history is the uh, Northeastern Center for Inner City Studies, um, which used to be run by um, Conrad Whirl, rest in peace, and um, Bob Stokes, um, who is still with us, those guys lived the history and were maintaining it at the same time. Salim Muakil, who was a co-teacher of mine in urban studies, he's still around and, I, and still acts as a professor in a variety of settings. And he's also a journalist, a well-known journalist. He's, these people are, are pretty active still in Chicago. So uh, I would recommend that. Yeah, go ahead, Ewan. Well, I would jump in there. I think that's actually a really great question. We do go to the History Museum because uh, DePaul students have a membership. So we go up to their third floor archive and the archivists show us around. But I think there's probably plenty of people in the city with basements full of mm -hmm. ephemeral material from this era that in the next <laughs> guy and <laughs> gay and Doug are pointing at each other. Um, sure. that, in the, that in the next... Um, 20 years will be disposing of that material somehow and we, we can't lose it and so I think any kind of coalition of I know there's a, a Chicago libraries coalition and um, but um, certainly uh, that any museum or library coalition should be um, there needs to be some concerted effort from across the city to collect up this material you know uh, and I think uh, otherwise it'll be lost I meant no, to I, I I meant to mention the uh, Newberry Library as well. I'm going to mention DePaul, DePaul Archives, mm -hmm. which has uh, all of the Young Lord stuff and Cha Cha stuff. They have all of the Rising Up Angries. Uh, they don't have a lot of other stuff that they probably will get. I mean, I'm, you know, I've been looking around. I've got the archives from Join, from Rising Up Angry, from 36 years at the Heartland. Uh, both rising up, both join rising up angry and the heartland put out newspapers. Um, and we have those and some of them have started to move to other places, but uh, I'm just going to make sure that people don't forget that Paul's got the stuff too. And just to throw a shameless plug in here. I mean, that's part of why we started to do this conference, right? Because we realized if our students are going to be researching their neighborhoods, researching Chicago, EBSCO is not probably going to have the best information and we need you know, as librarians, I need to hear this. I need to hear from people like who are here, Michael and Ewan and Katie. And well, we need got to start all my info. talking <laughs> about, you know, who, what are the organizations? Where is this information? How can we start to make it available? Um, you know, I think the libraries do a lot of things well, but I think this is a real something we can 
my hope is we can get better at and we can get better at helping do this research in, in kind of the immediate context. So my Zoom again is frozen, so I cannot see the chat. So I, I wasn't seeing questions that were in there. So maybe if, if one of the uh, other panelists can see the chat, maybe you can read out those questions, um, but I, I cannot get to them. <clears throat> uh, just the last one, the Newberry DePaul and Chicago History Museum are members of our consortium and Black Metropolis Research Consortium is what you were talking about. Allison, are you there? Yes, I'm here. I'm a program manager and archivist there, and my colleague put together, um, so I really enjoyed this conversation, this talk today, I really have, but um, there, for those who are in need of help making decisions about donating their collections, my colleague did put together uh, a legacy management resource portal, and I put the link in the chat, so it sort of um, helps any regular person who has not necessarily a lot of experience um, with, you know, research or what have you, uh, to make some decisions. They could have some really, you know, some huge, some great jewels, uh, some real gems, uh, but perhaps they're not in the scholarly community or, you know, yeah. academic community at all, and they just need some help. So it, quite honestly, um, you know, that I thought that that would be helpful based on the way the conversation was going. I'd like to name- Feel uh, free to share it. We yeah. have 20 members in, of the consortium and we often hear from people directly through our consortium. I just did recently, two weeks ago. So I put the gentleman in touch with DePaul because it was, was one of the earliest, um, it was about getting a collection. Oh gosh, the name escapes me. But the the woman was one of the earliest uh, graduates of DePaul's law, uh, black graduates of DePaul's law school, and had done some other you know things that she was known for. But maybe maybe I should say little known in some ways. wasn't a big name, but it was a it's a jewel. So the uh, he had a special collections. Jamie over there is in touch. You know so. I was going to mention, uh, there's also the Chicago Film Archives, I believe, and they have all kind of interesting stuff. I mean, I recently just saw for the first time the Church of the Holy Covenant, where we had our free health clinic, a mm -hmm. meeting from back in the early 70s when Dave Megacy, who had left pro football and wrote a book called Out of the League, one of the 100 best sport books ever, uh, he was speaking and I'm introducing them. And, uh, you know, this was some footage from the old days and they have lots of stuff. Um, and I would, for those of you who are interested in getting donations, because uh, there's more and more, as Ewan points out, some of these people aren't going to be around in 20 years. Uh, my, my information is it's Michael James. It's fatback, F-A-T-B-A-C-K at AOL.com. Fatback is like salt pork in your beans, that kind of fatback. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I, you know, just email me and then we'll at least be in touch about dispersing some stuff. Thanks, Michael. Yeah, I think yeah. the there's another question there. Are there any hidden gems? I don't know. I mean, there, there's probably all over the city that there, there's there's things that we haven't even thought about. You know, I think um, I, I always like taking them to to Grant Park and comp having them sit around the statue and compare it with photos of the day, just to sort of, uh, of the 60s. I mean, I, I, I also think though, the Democratic National, and this is where Mike can jump in, tell me I'm wrong, but the um, things as photos of you trying to push over police vehicles during the DNC. Um, but the, um, the Democratic National Convention of 68, that five day period in 68 is so dominant on, in the discourse of what Chicago activism was, and yet it's almost com completely disconnected to what was going on throughout the rest of the city at the time. And I think it really overshadows it. And I, I, I was, and, and this goes back to something Katie said, um, we were, I was watching, they made, how many Netflix films of the trial of Chicago seven can there be? And how few have there been of the seven women who were arrested in 1972 uh, or 70, early 70s, yeah, no, 72, I think it was, May of 72, yeah. Yeah. Um, 
who from from, from Jane and the Chicago Li- Women's Liberation Union. It's like there's such a dominance of much, much less you and the but many people, less, yes, many much less. Less the 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 black liberation struggles that Chicago was a leader in. Yeah, I mean, yeah, and, yeah maybe. Just, just yeah, I mean, yeah, the just Martin- this week we have the phenomenon of a, a Harold Washington film being released and shown as part of the Chicago Film Festival. But you know, he had to get elected right. mayor of of the city in order for that story to be told. When the building of of what made Harold Washington is all on the ground, and that's that's the story that is really not told near enough. And I would I would say Dusable Museum is uh, the source is a good source for that stuff now. I would say there was two other things. Firstly, I think we've often, we've not this year, just because of scheduling, but in the past we had Tracy Bain come in and tell us about the gay, the gay rights and the sort of uh, gay, gay liberation movement. That is actually pretty well documented. That's one of the better documented yeah. um, uh, networks, if you want to say. The one that I think is really missing, and this is basically because uh, Mike and I have not been able to trap people down, but in some of the Native American protest mm-hmm. movements of the ni- late 1960s, uh, the occupation of Belmont Harbor, the Native, um, the Indian village, roughly at where Wrigley Field is at Sheridan and uh, as it was it Clark and Sheridan, right? No, Clark and Sheffield, Addison, Clark, Sheffield, Waveland, that area Waveland. around Wrigley Field. Um, that I've not been able to find much on, and I think that kind of legacy of Native American protests that goes all the way back to 1893 and before, you know, there's a protest by Native Americans at the, the World 1893 World's Fair. But I think that is really under uh-huh. we're doing there's a lot, the Paul just did a land acknowledgement. I know the cities that have been doing some of that stuff, mm. but there's much more recent you know, yes, land acknowledgement is significant in, in the history of things, but there's people who are people who are still with us who were engaged in that work. And I think right now those voices are missing. Ewan keeps it pretty tight on Chicago. I'll try to spread it to other places. Uh, But with the Native American community, uh, you know, a lot of that got dispersed. People went back to reservations. People have died. Uh, So we don't have uh, people uh, who were involved in those two things around much. Yeah, the other one is the... um... Japanese American history, I think, is another one. There's a pretty good archive. There's a pretty good archive. There's a guy called Ryan Yokoda uh, who runs an archive at Clark and Montrose in the Japanese American Center. But there was a Japanese American intern camp, intern camp. There was a couple of buildings that the U.S. government interned Japanese Americans here on South Ellis Avenue. Uh, and I've not been able to identify which exact buildings that they, they were. Um, I'd have to do more archival work. So I think it's, uh, th- there's a lot out there. And I think um, it'd be great for more students to begin to understand some of these histories. Yeah. There's m- another question, uh, if Matt is frozen, is there yeah. much, is there much in how involved Chicago high school students were in anti-racial, in anti-war and racial justice work? Well, I was I was in high school when we started our work um, on the South Side, and it was it was anti-racism uh, because I grew up on the Southwest Side, and uh, you know, white flight was in full bloom. And <clears throat> when I mentioned earlier that neither the city fathers nor the church fathers, and they were all fathers, by the way, um, had the guts uh, or the principles to stand up and say. Um, get it together white people this is your problem you can uh you can figure out how to live together if if that's what's going to happen but no they were silent and and they were are complicit in the the appellation of chicago as one of the most seg- segregated cities in the north but there were a lot of high school kids involved and when i came to mundelein college and the anti-war movement was in full swing and we all went on strike in the spring of 1970 we involved Sullivan and Sen high school students and invited them to march with us up to Northwestern, which the students had declared a free state. They had seceded from the union <laughs> that week. <laughs> you know, some creative things occurred. Um, but anyway, and someone else asked about um, 
at Leads on Disability Rights Activism and Access Living in Chicago, led by the great late Marco Bristow, um, was one of the best uh, national uh, organizations to come out of the disability rights activism and, of course, the disability awareness uh, marches that started some years back in June started at uh, Soldier Field, outside of Soldier Field. So um, we do have some great activists on disability rights here in Chicago, but you've seen, you've seen them in the, con in the halls of Congress. Nothing could be more uh, stunning I than, think, than that. I, I'm, I'm, I'm mindful of the time uh, because there's a two o'clock session. I'd say a couple of other things quickly. We only have 10 weeks in our class, so we can't cover everything, you know, so we have a, a, a rotating uh, set of guests. It'd be wonderful to be able to do this for uh, 20 weeks a year. Um, no, Doug, don't quote me on that. Doug, uh, I'm all for it. I'm, I'm <laughs> That's a reference to, to Doug Long, who's the director of the program. Secondly, there's actually quite well, the National Museum of Mexican Art had a, uh, in Pilsen, they had a pretty well documented um a lot of the issues around school segregation, in particular overcrowding of, of uh, schools that catered to Mexican Americans in the 1960s and 70s, that led to a lot of protests in uh, in Pilsen and Little Village area. That is relatively well documented, both at, I think at DePaul, uh, the Teresa Fraga archives at DePaul, but also I think the National Museum of Mexican Art had an exhibit on that recently. So some of these high school protests are better documented than others. Well, yeah, well, let's, let's uh, wrap this up here, but thank you so much. Um, it's really interesting and, and really inspiring to think about this, just where it continues, right? There's continues to be activism, continues to be a need for activism and a need to collect and document this. And, and there will be future students that, that can continue to learn from the legacy that, that our panelists have, have participated in um, and furthered both with their work and their educational work as well. So thank you so much, Michael, Katie, and Ewan for sharing with us your, what you are doing. And um, yeah, we will um, hope to see you at a, a two o'clock session, but we, we wish you all well. Thank all you. Have a great day. And don't forget, live from the heartland, WLUW 88.7, Saturday morning, nine o'clock. All right, 88.7 AM or FM? FM. 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 All right. And then you could actually see a lot of Katie and I with this show at uh, youtube.com slash heartland media. We do this show and we interview a lot of actors. Okay. Sounds really good. All right. Take care. Adios. Thank you very much. Hope to see you all in person. I might have to just reboot my computer here. So <laughs> you, were, you were actually live some of the time. I mean, you visually you were live. Yeah, visually I'm okay, but all my buttons have disappeared and I can't like close it, can't click on the X, it won't do anything. So um, I'm gonna reboot. So all right, I'll well, see I'm you. I'm gonna leave you. So audio. All right, goodbye now. <laughs> bye bye.